Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Chinnery. I work here at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Troy, New York. And we have another one of our Lunch in the Garden programs here for you today. So we're very glad that you've tuned in. Um, we've been doing these programs since the pandemic began. And now that the pandemic is waning, uh, we're continuing. And next week, uh, at this same time and same station, we're going to have a program on dahlias. So look for your uh, Zoom invitation and your uh, email for the Dahlia program next week. And we hope you'll join us then. Um, if you want to watch this program again, you can go over to our YouTube channel and type in Cornell Cooperative Extension into YouTube. And that will take you to the presentation. When we uh, get it posted up, it will take a few days. And the other thing for today is that if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box and we'll go over those uh, at the end of the program. Okay, so that's our housekeeping. Uh, we've had a little trouble with our PowerPoint today, so you're going to see it not in show mode. You're going to see it in standard PowerPoint view. I'm not quite sure what this view of PowerPoint is called, but you'll see the picture. It just won't be as big as it can sometimes be, so don't be upset by that. Um, you'll just see a little bit smaller picture, but we're still going to see our pictures, and we have today one of our outstanding master gardeners, Keith Austin, who has been a master gardener since, let me see if I can get this right, 1992. Okay. Ah, I got it right. I, I try to remember their dates, but I don't always do that right. And Keith is a horticulturist. He's worked as an estate gardener. He's worked as a golf course uh, maintenance, uh, not superintendent, but somebody that knows all about turf grass and lots of different things in horticulture. So Keith has lots of experience as a master gardener and in horticulture as well. So we're very glad to have him here today. And he's gonna tell us all about hydrangeas, some of the most popular plants these days uh, in gardens and in garden centers. So I'm sure people are gonna have a lot of questions. So make sure you type them in the chat. And we'll, uh, if Keith doesn't cover it, we'll ask him and grill him at the end. It will sort of be like, uh, I don't know if anybody's been listening to the Supreme Court hearings where they had that poor woman in there for 13 hours yesterday. Uh, we won't be that hard on Keith, I hope, but keep your questions for the end. <laughs> so welcome, Keith. Thank you, David. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Happy spring. Uh, we're going to talk about hydrangeas. And uh, as David said, it's uh, probably one of the most popular uh, items at garden centers and nurseries, uh, maybe only exceeded by hostas and the variability and the, the number of varieties that are available. Uh, it is very popular perennial shrub because it, uh, it the blossoms, the blooms last a, a long time, maybe a month, maybe three months, four months into the fall. So uh, we're going to just dive right into uh, hydrangeas today. Um, and first thing we're going to look at is the USDA hardiness map, because most of us are in uh, zone 5A and B. And I heard of one person up, they believe they're in zone 3 or 4. And uh, this is the minimum cold temperature uh, that your plants have to tolerate. And that is the limiting factor in getting our, uh, generally the limiting factor in getting our macrophile of the blue ones, the, the deep purples, uh, to, to bloom. And so we'll take a look, closer look at that. Here's some of the temperatures in the last decade, our minimum temperatures. And quite frankly, the, the macrophyllas are, the, they are bloom hardy into these temperatures, but they're, excuse me, their plant is hardy into these temperatures, but the blooms uh, will suffer if the temperatures, I'm going to say below zero for any period of time 24 hours or so and you're losing your uh, you're losing some of your blooms so we're going to try to look at some strategies for heading that off all right though an old man i'm but a young gardener i enjoy doing these presentations because i learn a great deal along i prepare each one now this is um probably only my second uh experience with zoom and i immediately i um, I regret not having the feedback of uh, in the company of uh, sharing a room with you uh, because 
that's where we learn the most from each other and where I can pick up the most. But uh, we'll give it the best. And if you have questions at the end, we'll entertain those. So how to help healthy, happy hydrangeas. We're going to talk about the old ones, the new ones. And there's a lot being done in the last 20 years with hydrangeas. Uh, new forms, new foliage types, stronger stems, colored stems, uh, gold foliage, that kind of thing. Um, and what is a little stronger and hardier. And so we'll dive right in. All right, here's a hosta garden I uh, maintained for several years. And in the foreground, there are uh, some macrophylla hydrangeas with nary a bloom in sight. And this is what most of our macrophyllas look like um, through the summer. And we're gonna try to look at some strategies to rectify that situation. Three problem areas are how to prune them. Pruning is hydrangeas can be a little complicated. It's probably as simple as a COVID protocol to understand, but uh, maybe we can clarify some of that and maybe we'll confuse some of that. We'll do our best. Um, getting them to bloom and how to make them blue. We'll take a look at that. Okay, history descriptions, the different species, culture, care, and uh, how to get the macrophyllas to bloom, pests and disease. Now, one of the best things about this plant is pests and disease are hardly ever a problem. So we won't have to spend a lot of time on it. Here's the native range of, of hydrangeas. Uh, you see in the United States, the East Coast from Maine to Georgia, and the Pacific Northwest and the Andes. Uh, over in many of our varieties come from uh, Japan, China, and Korea. Uh, John Bartram was a colonial uh, era uh, plantsman. And he, uh, after farming for several years in the Philadelphia area, he scoured the Eastern United States, pre United States, uh, for different plants. And he's credited with uh, the, the introduction of both the arborescent and the paniculata hydrangeas. Hydrangea. Uh, fluorescent uh, flora, floret forms come in three varieties. The panicle, which is kind of a pyramid shape, the uh, white one on the upper left. The mop head, which is a round ball shape, snowball shape. Uh, and the lace cap, in which you have the, um, the sterile florets on the outside and the fertile flower form on the inside. So these are uh, paniculatas. These are the uh, panicle form. Um, they come in different colors and different uh, sizes and different um, uh, foliage patterns. And these are the mop heads, mostly um, uh, macrophyllas and arborescence. And if you look closely at the fluorescence, um, you'll see these, they're actually sepals, I believe, um, kind of like the bracts in a poinsettia. Uh, they're not really petals of a flower. And then inside, below the this uh, showy bract is the actual fertile flower. If you see in the lace caps, you'll see them. And so here are the lace caps you see with the uh, sterile florets on the outside and the fertile flowers inside. Now there are about 50 different species of hydrangea and this number goes up and down uh, depending on the genetic, the contemporary genetic research. Right now we're going to talk about um, six different species of hydrangea. These are the ones that are most commonly available in our garden centers and nurseries. This is the hydrangea paniculata, PG hydrangea, grandiflora. Um, this is the one that a lot of our grandmothers had in their backyard. And on the left, and on the right is the Annabelle, uh, the arborescent uh, hydrangea, arborescence Annabelle. Um, this is also a pop popular hedge type uh, hydrangea. Again, the paniculata grandiflora. Pretty easy to grow, can tolerate full sun and 
quite a bit of shade. Uh, it can be grown in a tree form or a shrub form. And uh, it's an old standard and still one of the best. It can grow to 25 feet. Uh, we're going to review a few of the, the paniculata forms. The pink diamond is a eight, eight foot tall, uh, comes out white and turns, turns pink very quickly. Nice plant. You can use it as a foundation planting or a specimen plant in a border. Uh, Tardiva has this kind of open, more open foliage look. It, this one can grow 10, 12 feet, and these uh, inflorescence are uh, large. They can be uh, 18 inches tall. Uh, Pinky Winky is one of the newer forms. It uh, has a red, can have a red stem. It uh, comes out white and turns pink from the bottom up. This is a, a very strong plant. It'd be a good one for uh, people looking for a hardy, uh, hardy plant into zone four and maybe into zone three as well. And quick fire again. Uh, some of the newer breeding programs are coming out with uh, improved varieties, uh, stronger stems, uh, color changes. Uh, long, longer lasting blooms and uh, quick fire is a good one. It comes out white and turns this pink mauvey color pretty rapidly. It's about a six to eight foot plant, six feet wide, six feet uh, tall. And, and you can control the size with some judicious pruning. Little lime, and we're gonna talk a bit about uh, limelight, which is a very popular paniculata. Uh, and little lime is a diminutive variety that I say diminutive. This is about a five, five foot tall instead of an eight foot tall hydrangea. So where space is more of a concern, this is a good one. Great star. I have not seen this in, uh, in real life, uh, but it's touted highly. I, I know it does well up into uh, Pennsylvania. I don't know how it will fare in our winters here, but it's very dramatic. These florets are four inches wide and uh, it's the, all the research says it's hardy in our area. So I, I am looking forward to seeing this plant in the landscape. Looks spectacular. Now Bobo is one of the newer ones. It's a, it's a small plant, about two to three feet, right, two to three feet wide. Uh, these smaller varieties are lend themselves nicely to a container. Uh, you could put these in a pot on the patio and especially where we talk about macrophyllis, um, containers should be a, considered an option because then you can move it into a garage or an, un, uh, an unheated, a cool space that will be protected from the most frigid uh, temperatures and wind. Firelight is a, a fairly recent introduction. Uh, I, I would doubt that it's as red as it appears in this photo, uh, but still it, it has a, a bright color for a paniculata, which uh, you know usually you're, you're getting in from mauvey to pink variety, and it's re reportedly uh, has quite a bit of uh, depth of color. So. All right, here's the limelight. This plant is uh, grows to about eight feet tall. It is a paniculata and it comes out this greenish color early on um, in the summer. And then it will turn to white in July and to August. And then it goes, moves on to uh, this mauvey color and you can leave it right on until it dries back to a brown if you want. But I would usually, um, it can be kind of floppy. These heads are large and in a August rainstorm, uh, that's a lot of weight. They hold a lot of water. And in fact, hydrangea means a uh, water vessel. So uh, uh, this is what I needed to do to support this this particular planet. All right. So we deadheaded it. Uh, in this would be like early in September, and this is after it's dormant. So maybe around the end of October, early November. Now it's pruned, you leave two, two buds on each, each cut. And then it, this is the next spring, it comes right back out and pushes out and it's eight feet tall by the end of the, end of the growing season. So 
Uh, paniculatas are best in full sun, but they can handle quite a bit of shade. They're easy to grow. They like rich, moist soil. Uh, they can tolerate some dryness. It's a great cut flower. They bloom on new wood. Now we're going to talk about this new wood and old wood uh, because there's a lot of uh, disagreement, you say, on, on how that happens. And even, even some of the people that have written the books have uh, come back and changed their ideas about what's new wood and old wood. So it can be trained in a, as a tree form, most often as a shrub form. So. Now, new wood and old wood. Uh, typically, we have new wood hydrangeas and old wood hydrangeas. The new wood hydrangeas are the paniculatas and the arborescence. And the old wood hydrangeas were the quercifolias, the uh, anomalas, the, the macrophyllas, and the serratas. And um, just the current way we're looking at this is that people are looking at this is that they're all old wood uh, plants, meaning that the blossoms, even when you prune them back, are in nodes where the flower, flower blossom has set uh, in the previous season. And that doesn't change. Um, even when we look at how I pruned that limelight, I still left two, two nodes or two buds. So that would be considered old wood, although we typically say that, you know, when you prune things back in, in springtime, what it pushes out is new wood. It, it is, but it also came from a node that was the previous year growth. So I'm going to take the tack in this presentation, it's the first time I ever have, that, uh, that all hydrangeas are old wood. You prune on old wood or you... They blossom on old wood. So, uh, having said that, let's go forward here. Uh, all right. So, the last time I, I talked about hydrangeas, I looked at when the flower set its bud and um, to know when to prune. And this still still works if you prune. The serratas, the microphylos, the quercifolias. Uh, after the fall, you'll be cutting off the the blossoms for the next year. So still need to time your still need to time your pruning, but uh, we're going to change it slightly as we go through here. Okay, the hydrangea arborescence or your Annabelle variety. This is an old standard favorite. Makes a great hedge. Uh, it can handle quite a bit of shade. Um, and now there's added to that, there's some reblooming varieties. And uh, Bella Anna is a colored variety. So you want to put a little color where you previously only had a white option. Now, this is a very hardy plant as well, uh, into zone four and possibly zone three. I haven't tried to grow anything in the, in the mountains yet. Uh, hey, Starburst is a, a multi floret. See the way these are stacked up because it had has a very interesting look. Incredible, this, look at the size of the florets, uh, the, the blossom here. Um, this is a, a very hardy plant, pretty easy to grow. And uh, a fairly recent variety is the mini that This is an arborescent and it does have this mauve color. And you still can get the uh, the hedge appearance, um, and it's it's pretty small. It's diminutive, maybe three by three feet. Now here's the wee white. This one is actually a foot and a half to two feet tall. A very pretty, very pretty plant. One you should look look for if you have trouble growing the others. So, leaf tire, leaf tire. Um, this is a little a little caterpillar that will uh, you'll find on most uh, many of your arborescent plants, and it sews the ends of the, the terminal leaf, <coughs> leaves together. <coughs> and this will um, this will not flower if this occurs. Now you can cut these off. You can uh, you can treat it a little bit. Uh, usually it's not that bad a problem. And you can sometimes be a little judicious in how you go about it, especially if you're concerned about the use of uh, some pesticides. Um, 
sometimes some years it's worse than others but just it's it's one thing to look for uh look out for it is probably the most um common best problem you'll find on hydrangeas <laughs> okay there are some great uh grower series of growers uh, out there and proven winners uh, i is a is a product that i uh, had a lot of great both success with there are other uh, series from um, the um, forever and ever the city line the uh, abracadabra there are many growers that have uh, developed their own lines of hydrangeas and uh, a quick internet search will will show you many of these and um, and i would encourage anyone looking to uh, add some hydrangeas to their landscape to do a little uh, quick work on the uh, on the internet before you hit the nurseries. So arborescence, tolerate full sun and full shade, bloom on new wood, again, um, I'll speak to that shortly, uh, native to the Northeast, excellent cut or dried, easiest, less floppy if not cut back in the spring, um, drought tolerant and the only deer resistant hydrangea, and that's in quotes because the deer will eat whatever they want, but this one is uh, less susceptible than some of the others. Now, um, new wood. When I prune this, I prune it to about 12 inches and I prune it after it goes dormant. Now they will blossom off these old stems and the stems will be sturdier if you don't cut it right back to the ground. And we talk about new wood, old wood. If you cut it to 12 inches and the blossoms come off of the 12 inch stem that's old wood and if new shoots come up and flowers off of um, the lateral lateral structures underground that's still kind of old wood so uh this this is where the the disagreement and the confusion can come in anyhow very very hardy plant uh excellent to zone four sometimes zone three uh, i wouldn't hesitate to to try this in zone three. Now this is the climbing hydrangea, Anomala petiolaris. And this is a great plant, it takes a couple of years to get started sometimes. You're gonna to have to baby it for a little bit. Uh, but once it's in, it uh, is a great plant. It requires no pruning, um, a little bit of fertilizer each year. Uh, it has these lace cap flowers. It's generally not grown for the flowers or for the floral uh, florets. It's in inflorescence. It's uh, grown the foliage and it does climb and it's beautiful. And there are some variegated varieties. We want that look. That is <laughs> okay. Uh, the climbing hydrangea uses these holdfasts to secure the cells to trees or walls or shrubs um, and these are they sometimes are referred to as root hairs but they are not root hairs they are old fasts and then um, and if you pull that off of that structure the plant will suffer quite a bit this is a picture of the, the garden at the mount edith warden's uh, estate and if you look in the sunken garden in the background that wall is covered in the uh, climbing hydrangea. It's quite quite lovely. This is a, a vignette of a garden I took care of, and again on the on the stone wall to the. It's covered up on my face in my my view, but uh, um, there is a climbing hydrangea, and this is a is a great uh, great use for this this kind of plant. And here's another garden I managed for a while and uh, on the left hand side against the stone walls climbing hydrangea great plant very uh, tough plant once it's established uh, it's it's terrific uh it's a slow starter it can take a few years to get going you gotta baby it a little bit initially uh it can grow to 60 feet um 30 and 40 feet routinely up to 60 i guess so center shade roots in the shade um like a clematis or um, some of the other plants, if you can uh, put something in, at its base to uh, keep it from the soil to from drying out, uh, it can be done with mulch, but uh, a little plant in front of the root, 
at the base of it to keep the hot sun right off the root, the roots uh, is helpful to get it going. All right, big leaf hydrangea. There's your purple and pink and blue ones. And uh, macrophylla means big leaf. So it's, um, they're, the macrophyllas are mostly mop heads. There are some lace caps. And the serratas are actually considered by many to be a subspecies uh, of the macrophylla. They call it hydrangea macrophylla serrata. Um, and they have this, uh, this toothed leaf. Um, and so we're going to talk about those. There's several beautiful varieties. And Nico Blue is an old time standard. Um, Hamburg is a, a color variable, the one that's a, a good, strong one, strong stems. Uh, City Line, this is a new, a fairly recent uh, series. Uh, there are many varieties, and each one offers some different. Uh, characteristics uh, that you may look for, uh, whether it's a colored stem or um, a different a different color blossom or a different form of uh, foliage. Uh, Lady in red. This is a popular one, um, kind of a lace cap form, but you see it's uh, with the, uh, the fertile part of the flower is a different color than the floret, and, and has a very nice appearance in the landscape. Uh, Nohana um, is a double Japanese uh, mountain hydrangea. And Frillibet. Now, if you have a, a place where next to a path or something where the, the details of the foliage or floret um, might be observed, uh, these, some of these uh, have a very delicate appearance that might be appreciated in that context. Again, stargazer, a lace cap, macrophylla with a double form in this uh, beautiful uh, floret that's two-tone. Wedding gown, multi multi floret, um, where even the uh, the different different sizes of the uh, the florets has a very nice appearance. Uh, Ray Mouton. This is the reblooming, um, and again, this is uh, goes back to our pruning old wood, new wood. The for the last uh, 15 years, um, since the um, endless summer was introduced, which was said to bloom on old wood and new wood, um, we we've called these reblooming uh, varieties the Ray uh, they, they they bloom on old and new wood. And with the latest, we're thinking now that it's all old wood. It's just that the, the bud has set uh, previously and you really can't tell that it's, uh, it's there. So endless summer, uh, sometimes referred um, as endless bummer or endless disappointment, uh, is still a good plant. And with a little care, you're going to make it, uh, you can make it uh, do what it's supposed to do. Um, now, there's some question of whether the ability to generate this uh, second uh, series of, of flowers or florets is um, it diminishes over time. And my experience, it, uh, it starts to go downhill in about five years, but I, maybe we're doing something wrong. We'll continue to try to figure it out. Um, uh, this is Forever and Ever is another series of hydrangeas and uh, has some very interesting uh, florette, the, uh, the, the shape and the color varieties available. And this is pistachio. Again, see what's being developed as far as uh, color variant. This is Raymontant or reblooming. Uh, freedom, very pretty thing. Again, that two toned uh, florette. And it is reblooming and everlasting. This is um, the, all the hydrangeas make great dried flowers, and they're easy to dry. Just cut them off and hang them up, uh, and they'll dry out if they're not in a proper environment. So. Soil. 
they all like moist, rich soil, but not, not wet and not too dry. Uh, so you've probably seen this chart before. And what you want is uh, to be in that circle where you have a kind of a, a mix of sand and silt and a little bit of clay. Some clay is uh, desirable because clay soils can be uh, very fertile. The uh, cation change uh, um, properties of a clay soil are uh, pretty pretty good uh, if, as long as it, the, it doesn't make the, the roots uh, soggy. Okay. And, uh, All right. Editing slide. I don't do that. Um, okay, what makes hydrangeas blue? Well, pH is one thing, and the other is aluminum. So uh, the flowers, if we want to make these color variable plants blue, we need to have aluminum available in the soil. Now, there normally is aluminum available in most of our soils but it's only available at a pH of around four and a half to five. And see this chart, this indicates uh, what nutrients are available at what pH. And normally this chart is not, does not, does not have the, uh, the bottom three entries on here. The third one up from the bottom is aluminum. And you can see that basically no aluminum or very little aluminum is available to a plant until we get the pH down into the fairly acidic range, um, four to five to four and a half to five. If you're down around four, the soil is probably too acid and the plant's going to die. So it takes some patience and to kind of tweak the soil into that range to get this aluminum available. So there are ways to do that. There are various products on hand. Um, adjusting the pH of the soil will normally make a, aluminum in the soil available. If you don't have any aluminum in the soil, uh, then you may need to augment it, supplement it. Planting. Planting is pretty similar to anything else. Uh, you want to dig a hole that's roughly twice as wide. Um, and you, you want to set this root ball uh, on solid ground and then fill it in so that it's at the crown is a grade. Uh, most of our plants from nurseries now are grown in like chopped bark or something like that. So you want to get rid of that. The plants like soil, not bark to grow in. And the nurseries uh, can by constant feed and water um, control the uh, nutrients available to plants. But this is not going to do well. So when you get a plant, if it's planted in bark, as most of them are today, um, get rid of as much of that as you as you can, and get some good soil around around those plants. Water, excuse me, watering. Uh, hydrangeas wilt in the afternoons in our summers, and that's okay. Do not need to water the plant if it's been if it has enough soil moisture. This wilting is not necessarily a bad thing or a sign that your plant is in really in distress. This is a normal behavior for hydrangeas. So you don't just flood the plant every time it looks like this. Uh, the plant will wilt in the heat and the sun. Um, and so as long as you're sure that you've had enough uh um, enough added enough water that week uh, that's all you need to do our normally uh our trans evap rates are about two tenths of an inch a day maybe a little higher uh, demand for a hydrangea than for a lawn but um uh if you're in the half to to one inch of of irrigation rainfall a week you should be healthy and you don't need to uh, water every time you see a hydrangea that looks like it needs a drink, because it may not. Let me skip that. Okay, the literature. The books I've uh, studied and worked from, uh, there are many good ones. Um, and a quick search on some of the uh, internet book selling sites will show all of these. 
some of my favorites are uh, Lorraine Bellato's uh, success with hydrangeas and um, Tim Bobel uh, has two books out, Hydrangeas in the North, Getting Blooms in Colder Climates and Today's Hydrangeas, both great uh, resources. Uh, I, my experience, uh, both of these uh, authors, um, one in Rochester and one in Southern Connecticut, uh, say they're in zone five, but I, I think that uh, if you look at the maps that they're really in zone six. And uh, uh, I don't think that zone six is quite a challenge as zone five is for growing some of these macrophyllas. Um, so here's a, a macrophylla. Um, and this is what it looks like probably right about now. Um, and most of these stems are dead and um, and they need to be cleaned out as soon as we determine. Some will be alive and some will produce flowers. So you don't want to just wholesale take everything out. All right. So, but how we're going to handle the pruning of the macrophyllas is we're going to take about a third of the stems down to about uh, eight to 10 inches in July. Now, don't take one off that it has a flower blossom on a terminal bud, um, but, but most of them will not. So take a look at the terminal bud and you're going to take out about a third of the plant down to eight or 10, 10 inches. And that's in July. Um, the timing can be right after the, uh, those that do blossom push out or, uh, and then you might want to deadhead uh, blossoms a few weeks after they, they do push it. And then when the plant goes dormant, um, we're going to cut, cut back anything that's going to stick out into the winter because it's going to be damaged by the cold anyhow. So you could cut back in October um, to where you can uh, reasonably mulch or protect the plant with uh, leaves or branches. Or And when you cut these things off, you can just set them down to act as a, a mulch or a protectant for the plant too. All right, so late November, early December, the plant's going dormant. And this is what you're going to try to do, some, some serious winter protection. This is leaves, it could be uh, boughs, uh, branches. Um, you could do, uh, I haven't seen it done for macrophyllas with burlap, but I think that that could be done. Anything you can do to help insulate the bottom of this plant for, through the winter. In spring thaw, you're going to have something that looks like this. And then in April, things will leaf out. And if this is old wood, you will have um, a chance that you're going to get blossoms on, on these shoots. Okay? Uh, normally, hydrangeas uh, blossom on a terminal, a terminal uh, bud, um, but they also can push out uh, on the second or third buds down on a stem. Uh, and then any plant that doesn't show growth by May, middle of May, um, you might want to just take that out. It's probably killed by the, by the cold. Okay. And July, this is what your plant looks like. My plants don't look like that, but maybe yours will look like it. Now, I have seen macrophyllas grown in, um, in our area that are absolutely outstanding, like this picture. And, but they have, a, um, in most cases, they have a very specific microclimate, uh, an alley between two houses in city of Rensselaer, um, a, uh, a, one of those stoop gardens on Washington Park in Troy. And they have a very protected, almost a heated atmosphere and they thrive. And I'm jealous of, of that kind of thing. So macrophyllas, most are mop head. They need moderate sun. Uh, they can handle a bit of shade, especially in the afternoon. Uh, avoid winds. Um, Winds are, uh, can desiccate and uh, uh, need to be protected from the winter, in the winter time. They like rich, moist soil, uh, clay acid loam, guard against late frosts, um, and they have a very long season of bloom. All right, now we're going to talk about serratas. Serratas are subspecies of macrophylla, and they're mostly lace caps. They are hardier, they're stronger. They uh, can handle a lot more cold. They're more bloom tolerant. So uh, I recommend the uh, serratas if you want some of this color. Uh, again, they don't have the big mop heads, uh, but 
uh, they are uh, probably easier to produce a consistent flowering. Uh, here's a tiara, as it, it is color variable, and it, it can go from pink to, to blue and everything in between. And it has a nice reddish fall foliage as well. Oh, back to, tiara has this, uh, these outer florets will inflect at the end of the day. It's kind of a nice appearance. They kind of um, bow down and then they uh, come back up the next day. Um, Niyama Ye Murasaki. Um, this is a, a blue double, color variable double, beautiful thing. And Blue Billow is a fairly recent introduction. Um, very strong, uh, strong stems, strong flowering potential. Um, so this is one you might look for. I don't know that I've seen it in any local um, local nurseries, but uh, online you, you certainly can find it. The uh, serratas benefit greatly from a little winter protection. The sun and the uh, wind can desiccate and, um, and hurt this plant. You do not want to prune this. You can deadhead early as soon as the flowers um, dry back, die back. But uh, you do not want to nick the terminal buds because the terminal buds will be the flowers for the next year. Or two. Um, so you leave this and then you prune it uh, the following year. Anything that dies back, anything that didn't flower. Serratas. Most are lace caps. Uh, proper sighting is essential. They, they can't handle too much sun or too much wind. Um, they can tolerate a lot of shade. They will burn in full sun. Uh, so the edge of under a drip line of a plant that has is bright but not not burning sun. Um, have a good season of bloom. They bloom on old wood. Good fall color, changeable colors, and they're very easy to grow. So this is a good one. More of us should look for. All right, quercifolia. This is the oak leaf hydrangea, um, and it's a very nice plant in the right spot. It's not a huge plant. It's similar in, in the um, as the serratas in its uh, cultural requirements and its uh, need for uh, sun. Um, it can handle quite a bit of shade, can handle quite a bit of sun, um, and it does have uh, good fo foliage. Colors. There are several varieties out now. The peewee is a smaller variety um, in, this, in the three, three foot jet stream. These are about a five foot one. Uh, little honey has this yellow foliage. Ruby slipper is a nice red variety. This is a fairly diminutive variety. And uh, good for south or west exposure. Loves full sun, loves heat, rich, moist soil. Deer love them. Oh, you have to put repellent on the end of the week. So you use something like Repelzol or your own home concoction. And um, and they do flower on old wood, so do not do not cut back. Um, this uh, they're good dwarf, dwarf forms and great fall color. Okay, managing the foil wrapped hydrangea. All right, uh, you may see these in the uh, uh, supermarkets and uh, flower shops. Um, and this is the gift hydrangeas. Now these babies are juiced up to the extent that their, their, their lighting is controlled and their nutrition is controlled and they're uh, given vitamins and catalysts and uh, all kinds of things. And these are so whacked out that they don't really know what they are. And so I generally would recommend throwing these out after they, now I have heard people that save them and I've heard many people that save them and never see another bloom. So if you want to devote the time, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's probably easier to, to uh, buy a proper hydrangea at a garden center than it is to try to rescue one of these things for a repeat bloom. Yeah, drying hydrangeas is very easy. Cut them off and hang them up or cut them off and just keep them in the dry. They, they really take nothing to dry hydrangeas. Now, some sources of information. Hydrangeas in the North, we talked about that book from uh, Tim Bobo, Proven Winners, great online sources. 
of information. Hydrangeas Plus is a is a mail order place out on the West Coast, and they have many varieties and tons of information. And when I used to do this presentation in uh, in person, they would uh, offer me a free catalog for each uh, participant. But I think you can get that downloaded free um, online. It's great, full of great information. And I want to hear some places where you can buy hydrangeas. Um, we have a lot of sources locally and there are a lot online, so you should be able to find what you need. And uh, so that's it. Any questions? That was great, Keith. I learned a lot. <laughs> I forgot I have a climbing hydrangea, so I'm glad you mentioned great. that one. Great. <laughs> So, uh, I forget that you have. <laughs> yeah, I forgot I had that, and it's huge. And uh, it really, it does get going slowly, but man, once it starts to grow, it is very large and very powerful. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody has a question, you can type it in the chat box. I think Marcy's going to read them to us, right, Marcy? Sure, I'll start now. Um, okay, Keith. I have a very old bush that my mom called Snowball. Do you know if that is a hydrangea? Uh, it probably is a hydrangea. It could also be a viburnum. Uh, there are snowball varieties of both, but um, if it's a snow snowball hydrangea, that would probably be the Annabelle, an old Annabelle uh, classic variety. So. <laughs> Maybe she could send us a picture or something. Would you be yeah. able to tell from a picture? There are, um, there are actually many more uh, species and varieties of viburnum than there are hydrangea but uh -huh. um uh so they're very they're kind of there's some quite a bit of overlap on that there's one plant i i didn't mention and i don't know why there's a a false hydrangea the schizophragma hydrangea hydrangeoide um which is a, a different uh, from a different uh, section of the hydrangea tribe not the genus and it is a climber like the anomala. And that is a, a, I'm seeing that more and more. And it looks like a lace cap and it's an, a, a pretty strong climber like the anomala. So you may see that as well. So. All right. I have a beautiful hydrangea plant, but it has never bloomed. Lots of greenery, east facing, does get some buds, but they never progress into anything. Should I try and dig it up and move it elsewhere? Or is it possible it will just never bloom? All right. Well, I'm going to confess now. I haven't. Uh, I designed landscapes, and not a lot, but uh, three or four a year. And I have not put a macrophylla hydrangea in any of my designs in the last uh, 15 years. Um, I do move them. I endlessly move them to try to find the spot where they will do well and have success. And I also use this uh, mulching, um, this formula, and I. Am able to coax some blossoms, although they seldom look as prolific as they did uh, coming from the nursery. Uh, I would try this strategy, this prune, um, in July and mulch the heck out of it. Try to keep it protected from the cold, and uh, give that a year. And if you still still didn't have anything, then try to find a more protected spot. Um, the, the microclimate is everything with these in Arizona. Okay. How do we know if we have, how do we know if the varieties we have are old or new? Um, <laughs> I guess, you, yeah, I guess you could, if you know the variety, uh, put it into Google and it'll tell you probably when it was introduced in some place. So, uh, so go uh, the tag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, 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 I don't have an easy answer for that. So. Okay. Uh, somebody else said, please mention fertilizer for when you plant and during the season. Okay. Um, soil preparation is key. Now, fertilizer is not as critical as uh, this. Our soils have most of the nutrition that we want. I fertilize my hydrangeas four times a year, and I use way too much fertilizer. Um, I also use, I'm a fan of humic acid, which makes the available nutrients in the soil uh, more available. It improves the cation exchange rates of our soils. Um, so 
you don't need to fertilize the heck out of most of these hydrangeas. They can find a lot of what they need. Some of the re the resources, um, the books I are very tremendously on this uh, topic. Uh, Tim Bobo will recommend high nitrogen um, in the springtime, and Lorraine Bellato will say uh, low nitrogen and stronger uh, potassium and um, phosphorus. Uh, so for the um, a general balanced fertil fertilizer is good in the springtime. And then I think I would, uh, a soil test is always a good thing to have. You don't need to add um, the wrong amounts of anything. The uh, nitrogen is kind of ephemeral, uh, moves through the soil quickly. Uh, the others uh, promoting strong plant uh, physiological development, uh, phosphorus and, and potassium are probably more important to having a good, strong, healthy plant. So I don't know what you think about that, David. Uh, I think a soil test is a good idea. And I agree with everything you said. I think the nitrogen moves around a lot, so we have to replace that. The phosphorus and potassium may be there, but it may not be because we see soil tests that come through our office with low potassium and low phosphorus sometimes. But often those are amples, but you don't know that. So, you know, I guess you can go, like you said, use a general purpose fertilizer in the spring and kind of cover all your bases, you know, if you want to do a sort of a, a shotgun approach. All right, next question. Would it be better to purchase new plants or can I propagate from the ones I have? I like to create a tree form. Okay. Um, I don't see a lot of tree form um, plants at the nurseries uh, lately. Most everything is a kind of a shrub, a shrub form. So um, it's difficult to, to um, you can't really divide a, a paniculata, and that's the one that lends itself most to tree form. So I, I would probably buy a paniculata, and, or you could uh, you could layer it. You could uh, do a tip a tip uh, cutting. Um, you could bend the bend the branch down to the ground, kind of scratch it a little bit, and maybe a little root hormone. Uh, put it under a rock and and see if she develops uh, uh, some roots over time. You know the propagate propagation techniques, uh, um, standard propagation techniques work uh, well. But the, if the effort is uh, too much, um, you can you can buy buy one and then just prune it as it grows. Probably wouldn't hit it too hard. I know the older paniculatas, if you prune them hard, they sulk and may even. Uh, I I overdid it on one that was probably 40 years old and uh, took that baby right out. So I, I would have been uh, much more ginger in my approach to these things since then. So. Um, somebody asked if there was a cricket in the Zoom, so somebody must hear something that I don't hear. <laughs> um, what hydrangeas are the most deer resistant? Uh, well, the, the arborescence are supposed to be um, the most deer resistant, but again, uh, with the, when the deer are hungry, it's, uh, it's very difficult. I do uh, use arborescence in when I'm trying to design a landscape for uh, a uh, a high deer population area, and uh, I, the uh, it, problem is the deer don't go after the top; the chipmunks go after the bottom. So you got to be careful. <laughs> um, is there a way to make the stem stronger? Uh, the judicious pruning uh, is the best best way to make stems stronger. Prune to the right height on an arborescence. If you prune to twelve inches or so. That will help strengthen stems. they will be less floppy. Uh, buying the right variety with strong stems is a little research is a, a good way to help that. And then uh, that limelight that I showed where I had everything tied up, uh, that will firm up if you don't prune it way back um, each year. But I, I found that the, uh, that the extra flowering was, dramatic enough it was worth the, the support. So. Um, somebody asked if you could go back to the online source list. So did you, was that a slide in your PowerPoint? Let's see, online, uh, 
Okay. Media. Well, that's not the online one, but uh, um, Hydrangea's in the North, Proven Winners, and Hydrangea Plus. Okay. Um, I don't know. There's still lots of questions. I don't know how many we want to keep going here. There's like still 20. Um, if I decided to do a boo boo in a pot on my uh, boo boo in a pot oh, on boy. my deck, yeah, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. How do I winterize in my garage? Do I water all winter? Do I wrap it in burlap? Yeah, uh, bubble is pretty hardy, so you, it doesn't need a lot of uh, cold protection. Um, it does need, it can't really dry out. So uh, a corner in the garage and you can keep an eye on the, the moisture um, is good. A wind protected area outside could be fine. Uh, again, you got to watch uh, desiccation from wind and, uh, um, and just dry it. They don't want to be in dust for three months. So, uh, What is a terminal bud? Just the end of the stem. Can you propagate hydrangeas and if so, how? Uh, you got to be careful because a lot of these, particularly the ones that I showed you here, are are copyrighted, protected, uh, patented varieties, and you're you uh, you're not supposed to uh, just uh, pirate those. Uh, on the other hand, um, all the normal the normal techniques, uh, you can divide the mac uh, macrophyllas um, if you have in a, just a few years a a two gallon plant will become a, a three foot diameter plant at the base. And so you could cut that into two, three, four pieces and, uh, and multiply your, your macrophyllas that way. Um, the um, arborescents are easy. You can just put a shovel in and break some off. Uh, they send out rhizome-like root growth and then uh, that's easy to just take off a piece with some roots and uh, um, and you can plant that. Uh, they most of them are uh, you can do leather layering, tip cuttings. So there's many ways to propagate hydrangeas. I want to plant hydrangeas next to my garage, but doesn't get too much sun. What would you recommend? Uh, the Annabelles, the arborescent varieties, the uh, um, any of those would be would be fun. Okay, I'm skipping around here. Um, I fertilized my Nico blue hydrangea and flowers were blue, pink, and purple. What did I do wrong since they were not all blue? Uh, I think you did great uh, <laughs> to get, to get <laughs> a, a good variety. Um, uh, th that is just uh, the, the absorption of aluminum at each spot in that root root mass is uh, is what that's about and that's a you know it's a while that can be controlled in the nursery in the landscape it's very hard to control that so what is the best way to protect protect hydrangeas from deer um you, you can cover them you can uh, mulch them you can uh, use any of the uh, commercial or privately prepared uh, it's difficult to, you know, the, the whole doing battle with deer. Um, this year, I put plastic fencing around a lot. So. Uh, there are stories of burying pennies in the ground to get the blue color. Does that really work? Uh, I've never buried any pennies in the ground, so I don't know <laughs> that I can make a real recommendation on that. Uh, um, that wouldn't be a loop, then. Yeah, it's no aluminum in the in the copper penny. I don't I don't know how that would help you. Um, it uh, I don't know if it would contribute to to uh, lowering the pH or not. But I think there are probably easier ways. Maybe not cheaper, but easier. Is there anything you can do to keep the tree form growing more upright? Mine seems to droop as if it wants to return to the shrub form. Uh huh. Um, I I don't know. Even when they're in the tree form, they do have that uh, reflexed kind of uh, attitude. You know, they want to, they bend, bend, uh, they bend back toward the ground. Um, I, you know, some support, like a standard, like you would for a, a rose or something like that, possible. Um, I, I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have any ideas on how to, how to make that stronger. Uh, maybe you could uh, try to reduce the weight on the top until the until the the trunk gets stronger. You know, in a couple of years, cut it back and then let it spread out. How do you divide HM? How do you? Uh, I do it with a chainsaw or a sharp uh, uh, transplant spade and uh, just go right down the middle and ch chop it. Um, I frequently divide them into two or four four parts. It's not um, good for the chainsaw. So. <laughs> I think I have a pink diamond and it's huge, way too big for where it was planted. How bad is it going to be if I screw up pruning it? <laughs> well, I think I, I, it won't be bad, but I think I would wait until after it blossoms this year. Uh, you know, you might as well enjoy one year. Anything you take off at this point um, is uh, actually, I think, diamond. You could prune right now before it warms up. Um, just don't take it back. Leave a couple of leave a couple of nodes, a couple of buds. And you can take it way back and then move it and then uh, you should be fine. So. Are there any that are fragrant at all? Is Tardivia fragrant? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, uh, I've never planted a hydrangea for fragrance and, uh, um, and I've never really noticed the uh, fragrance from the hydrangeas. So uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think a little internet search might come up with a better answer than I could give you. So. Okay, one last one here. Um, we have Annabelle's that didn't get pruned last fall. Is it too late to do them now? Uh, it's not too late to do them now, but um, you, you might might wait and let, let them go. They'll just be a little floppier, a little weaker uh, this year. Um, and then uh, then you can treat them properly next, next year. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I got them all. There were several thank yous and great jobs and marvelous thank presentation. Um, and I, I think I hope I covered them all. Well, that's great. I love all the questions. And it sort of was like the Supreme Court hearing. There was a lot of them. So I know. That's why I said, wow, how many are we doing? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you, Keith. I, I really enjoyed this program. There's a lot to know about these things. And, uh, you know, it used to be that we just had the Nico Blue and the Climbing Hydrangea and Annabelle, and that was about it. And now there's just a proliferation of all these different colors and sizes and compact and big ones. So it's really quite amazing um, what you can find out there. So thank you for showing us these plants and thank you for helping us sort them all out and the mystery of the blue and pink and purple flowers. So thank you, Keith. You're very welcome. Thank you. Enjoy it.